used to Like they, like they, like they 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 used to Like they, like they I wish that Greenville National did have some type of signage or something down there to show that Greenville National was the first league down at Bayside Park. All right. Uh, I wish that they would do a lot more to recognize Greenville National because there were a lot of great players coaches and a lot of people. I met a lot of friends along the way out of Greenville National. In front of uh, Mr. Carlos Baker's house, uh, I can say this is where it all began for me on this block, Freedom Place, where uh, Mr. Baker and my parents lived. And I grew up and uh, here and right around the corner is Bayside Park, right around the corner. And a guy couldn't ask for anything better than that, to, to live in a great neighborhood like this. Baker was was the president of the league. Fine gentleman, knew a lot of people, and we got a lot of things done, and uh, he made things move, and a lot of things we didn't get done, because what happened is that by being in a poor neighborhood, the benefits didn't come that easy. You know, and what happened, he tried, he tried, he tried. We had affairs, we, we uh, had the city to build us a grill down at the park where we would uh, cook hamburgers, hot dogs, and, and sell them to the, to the parents, you know, they were watching the game, you know what I mean? And this is a lot of times how we created money and stuff like that for our league. I hate to go back and uh, talk about the election, but I'm gonna talk about the election when Mr. Baker beat out Mr. Smith. They had the election there at <laughs> Mr. Baker won the election. Baker had one thing that Fisher, I mean, Mr. Smith didn't have, and that's some, a little midget that voted. He was grown, and he voted. That gave Mr. Baker the um, thing. Carlos Baker. Carlos Baker was the president of Greenville National Little League. Uh, when I came here, he kind of opened the doors and uh, said, look, we'll, you do a minor league team, and and I, I went and got a sponsor for my minor league team. It was Big Bob Terry's. Uh, and he, he paid for the uniforms and all of that uh, for the kids. But Carlos, um, Carlos put in just as much time as the coaches put in. And, you know, we had a lot of coaches down here. So, I mean, I'd come down here at my games, and I'd go home after my games. Well, Carlos would be here at everybody's game. So he was putting in a lot of time. He'd stand up at that grill and cook hot dogs. And then when we needed equipment, he would call us in and we'd go to Hoboken to get equipment like gloves and, and catches equipment and things of that nature once we got our stipend from the city to get the stuff. If we didn't get enough money, well, guess what? Carlos was selling dinners out of his house and uh, trying to raise money. Mr. Baker, remember Mr. Baker? He was the best. He the one started the whole thing. And I'm glad he did, because he kept us on track with everything. We wasn't in the streets. We was always down there hanging out, playing ball, doing something constructive, positive, because we have positive people. Uh, Mr. Baker um, was a great influence on so many kids, and he brought, he made the league better. He brought more uh, enthusiasm and a little bit, and each year the league improved with different equipment. Uh, I can remember playing, and they and behind the backstop they had the uh, 
the announcer there, which gave the kids a feeling like he was in the major league because you can hear, the, hear them announcing the games there. And, and Mr. Baker used to be there on the mic there. Carlos Baker, uh, I remember when he first took over, played for Bus Stop Lounge. Um, I think the year, maybe two years after that, is when he took over the league for Bruce Dabney. And he ran the league for about maybe five or six years. I'm not really sure how long he ran the league. But he did a pretty good job. Um, he was pretty. He was a fair coach. He was good to me. Um, I enjoyed playing for him. Um, I did learn a little bit under him, but I was a little shorty at the time, so I was just getting into to baseball at that at that moment. Mister, Mister Baker and Mrs. Baker, they they were they were fantastic leaders, and keeping this Greenville National alive, functioning and very competitive with other teams. Funny story with him, <laughs> he was umpiring. I was up at that, I was a little pudgy kid. And a pitch came and almost hit my stomach and I jumped back and said, ooh. He was laughing so hard that he couldn't even call it a strike. It was a strike right down the middle. <laughs> and he looked back, and he looked at me and I looked back at him. I said, what was that? He laughed ball, he said, this is your gift because that was funny. And that was one thing, but he taught me Mr. Perkins taught me, I used to pitch from the stretch. Mr. Perkins is the gentleman that taught me to pitch from the windup, and I had more velocity on the ball. He taught me, I used to throw a split finger fastball. He taught me how to throw a changeup and a close finger fastball. Mr. Perkins, he's been a great help to the Greenville National Little League, one of the founding fathers, a great foundation for Greenville National Little League. Um, had a pleasure not only to uh, play for him, meet his kids, um, know that he's a well, well-rounded, sounded person. Um, Come on now, here you are. I'm here in Bayside Park for the first time since I stopped coaching Little League. Oh man, it brings back a lot of memories. They got more grass than we had though. They must have imported some grass in here because we didn't have none, we played on the dirt. <laughs> But yeah, this was a great place. I mean, you know, we had a lot of fun. We had a lot of great kids. Uh, when I first started, I used to coach a minor league team called uh, Big Bob Terry's. And uh, I had that team for about two years, two or three years. And then uh, I used to win all the time. I was, I was, I was, uh, I guess I was uh, lucky, I guess. <laughs> and then I got promoted to take up Murray Stars after Rock left. Rock was here down here winning for a lot of years. Rock Jackson. That was my mentor, my big brother. Always stayed on my back, going to school, coming to school, off the field and on the field. He used to coach the other team, but he make sure I was good. He made sure me, all us, Art Sad, Glenn Sad, made sure we did our thing. We made sure we stayed in the books, and he that we didn't. Maybe. Without him being us, staying on us, a lot of people wouldn't be here now today. But Rock was our mentor. One of my most memories, memorable memories about Rock was he would motivate you in his own way. Wow. How you guys doing? Um, tell the truth, tell the truth. <laughs> <laughs> it's been too many years. Right, You're hiding back. Right. It's time to confess. All right, all right. I've been running around through my house, man, and looking up under things and behind things and over things, that mostly over things. And um, I found a little something. And the little something was like, um, it was something that I forgot to give Rock or didn't give. I'm not going to say forgot. I didn't give Rock. I don't remember exactly. 
right? And um, look, he's one of the favorite people I got in the world. It's everybody's favorite. Yeah, right. that's what I'm saying. Yeah. You know, he always made everybody laugh. Mm -hmm. He used to scare me. I'm saying, what the heck? But anyway, <laughs> you know, the thing is, like this here, it was like um, I, I found this little piece and I really wanted to give it to him. I really wanted to give it to him. And um, the piece I found out I wanted to give it to you was um, ah. back in 1982, right? Right. <laughs> Rock was uh, coaching the Murray Stars. And I found this, and uh, being that the business is long, no longer there, I think I'd love for you to have this piece right here. Because this piece is trophy that's saying, Greenville National Little League 1982 Murray Stars. And I tell you, so I need you to take this home with you. Right, take right. care of that. Speech. I got you. Um, <laughs> need some tissue? I got that in my bag. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> But um, I thank you for that. Mm -hmm. I thank Murray Stars for that. Yeah. And uh, boy, y'all, 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 y'all make me cry right now. Actually, so we okay. thank you. That's why no, you're no. getting that. We thank you, yeah, buddy. Right, right. Trust me. We thank oh, you. Oh man. That's right. You deserve Champagne, it, they shouldn't have did this to me. <laughs> <laughs> I hey. thank all y'all though. No. I really do. I, I, I thank y'all from, service, bro. from the time y'all was little guys right. until the time y'all was men now. Yeah. I thank all y'all. Warren, from <laughs> <laughs> uh, 4th Street on down, yes. baby. Yes, baby. Yes. You've been my man. You've been my man. We us. Okay. We are. We're us. And, and Chef A. Don't forget you coach too now. Yes. I can't forget you neither. No, she always talk about her doing this this book work. She yeah. coached just like yes. the rest of us. Yes. She, she coached just like the rest of us. She did. Right. She was out there. And I, I like I said, I thank all y'all, man. Right. I, Randall. Chris, right. I thank all y'all. Warren, thank you. Yes. always in my heart. They're going to always be in my heart. You're going to be in my heart too. Yeah. Hello, Glenn Sapp here, um, proud of the Greenville National Little League. Uh, I remember the first time I came down here in the 70s. Uh, I was brought down here one day by my pop, me and my brother Art. Aggravated my pop to the point where one day he said, come on, let's go to the park. During that time, I can't remember the coaching staff. It was a team down there practicing. And we watched it for a few minutes and my pop told me, you think y'all can do that? And we told him, sure, we can do that. And so we went on and he said, well, go ask the coach. We asked the coach, said, what position you wanted to play? Coach put me at first and my brother at third, I believe. And we held it down since then. I think the year before the same, that same team never won, won a game. That year, I think we won about six, eight games. We had a winning record that year. Uh, and I'm sorry if I forgot the coach's names. I always remember them when I see them. I apologize, but um, they, were, they gave me my start. Uh, kid from Jersey City just had me walking through the park. My name is Arthur Saab. I played for Greenville National Little League, 1976 to 1980, 81. Um, I first got started down here. My, my father brought me down here, and from there I ran from there. Met a lot of great people. Um, it gave me the starting point I really needed in sports. Um, Greenville National Little League brought me to the point to where I grew and developed into a sports figure. Um, and Greenville National Little League, Little League did this for me. What I do remember is just having a lot of great experiences down here in the National Little League. Uh, being coached by a lot of great, great men uh, who wanted to help the young guys not just develop into baseball players, but also develop into productive young men. My name is Adrian Thorpe, played for Greenville National Little League from the 70s to the 80s. So, tell me, did you enjoy yourself playing Greenville National? Baseball? Best years of my life. It's best years of your life? 8 to 12, yep. Uh, tell me why it was best years of your life. Uh, you got to be outside, have fun. Just just the competition. And now I look back, the same kids I played with almost 40 years ago. I still see them today and we still friends.
My name is Councilman Jermaine Robinson, and I played for Greenville National Little League. And I played for Tulo Oil, which was always in the championship conversation. Mm -hmm. And I also played for First uh, National Banks. Okay. Um, my first coach was Jim. He, he was uh, my Tulo Oil coach. Mm -hmm. And then I had Craig Brown. Mike right. Goins okay. uh, and, and 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 Mr. Harris, which mm -hmm. was some awesome coaches, and they always stressed, you know, getting better. They always stressed more than just baseball. They stressed to us about life and about doing something better with our life, even if it wasn't in baseball. Right. And and what I can say, I, I, I think I had a super mom down here as well, right. because once we joined the league, you know, my mother became the president, right. and she used to open the hot dog stand, and she used to open the concession stand, and she he would go everywhere with us and you know my father was always a worker and he was out doing his thing but those coaches became our parents you know t right. still to this day I see coach Craig Brown right. and I call him coach right. and it's always love it's, it's never been a moment where I didn't you know have a great conversation with coach Craig and so that's what I, I would really want to take from this is that Coaches can be more than just a coach. They can be a mentor. They can be a big brother. They can be an uncle. They can be a father figure. Because a lot of times growing up in this area, and I had a father, but he worked so much he wasn't right. able to be right. here. Right. You know, he right. worked to send us to school, but mm -hmm. our coaches was that father figure each and every time we came down here. I remember my coaches picking us up and dropping us off home. Right. You know, it was it was just it was that important for them to always be in our lives right. and to make sure that we wouldn't say, hey, well, we got homework, we got this, and so I'm gonna go out and just do something else, and I won't make it to the field. They was always the ones to carpool and pick us up, and I think that's what was really important in my life right. and and growing to the man that I am today, being a councilman right. here in Jersey City. Right. It, it's because of people like Craig and and Mike and Mr. Harris. Uh, yeah, those people that really help shape and form my existence and being here in Jersey City. Well, I hope you guys can see to see how little that jacket is. One of my most prized possessions, my Murray Stars jacket. Um, one of the absolute best times of my life. It actually set the foundation for me as a man to this day. There are some coaches that I call mentor. Uh, including my father, John Stokes Sr., who was one of the coaches over here at Greenville National. He coached the uh, first National Banks team, which was the green team. Uh, but specifically, I'm going to be talking about what's near and dear to my heart, and that's my Murray Stars. Um, it's so interesting, as a nine-year-old, back in 1976, 75, actually, um, to start out in life as a winner. And what do I mean by that? Murray Stars, we were an attraction. We were the best. From 76 to 79, my four years, we were absolutely the best. I believe my coach, Rock Jackson, said we might have lost one game in four years. I'm gonna believe him on that. I recall we not losing any games in four years. Um, I have been very, very fortunate to play organized sports. I've been blessed with, 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 with you know, some, some really good athleticism. God has been really, really good to me. So I've, I've started out with baseball through high school, basketball, football, baseball, tennis. I've had my, my, uh, my PBA, my professional bowling associations, uh, a pro license for two years. I've won golf tournaments, not as a professional, but I'm a very good golfer and I've won some really good um, tournaments with some of my with some of my friends and other mates, but I can tell you, out of all of the organized sports that I've ever played, the team that's most dear to my heart is my Murray Stars. Um, you know, like I said, we lost not much. Whenever we played, the stands were packed. We put on a show. Uh, I'm gonna try my best to name a couple of my teammates right now, and I'm gonna do the best I can. Some I'm gonna forget. Like I said, it's been four years, so forgive me. But Cornelius Hagen, Derek Baker, uh, Rich Lee Park, Slip, Terrell Hampton, uh, Norman McGee, Cleveland Eatman. Um, did, did I miss any? Uh, oh, Bryant Lane, Cleveland Eatman. I might have said Cleve Bake. I might have said Bake Norman, uh, Coach Rock Jackson. Cliffy Perkins, Dean. Um, these are just some of the people that have shaped me as my, as a, a, you know, as a man. And like I said, you have absolutely no clue the impact and the power 
the fact that you can start out as a nine-year-old as a winner. I'm talking to you, hey, Jersey. I'm talking to you, I'm talking to you. So let me give you the history of Dead Man's Hill. Dead Man Hill was that area where we would get on the top of it, we would ride our bikes down and our skateboards down and we would challenge one another. Whoever made it down there without spilling and tearing their knees off, they was the winner. So Dead Man Hill has so much history to it because it was feared. People would not come flying down Dead Man's Hill and the worst thing you wanted to do was try to ride your bike up. That was another challenge we did as kids. We would see who can ride, whose legs were strong enough to drive up Dead Man's Hill without stopping and usually we couldn't make it to the top. It was only a few of us who, who was capable of that and I wasn't one of them. This is we on the legendary Dead Man's Hill. This is where you learn how to ride a bike, how to keep your balance, because if you didn't, you was gonna fly over there into that baseball field over there. I've seen a lot of people do that. We also used to sled in the winter time, but this was the fun hill. It was called Dead Man's Hill, but it was a fun hill. And yes, Dead Man Hill. Do not ride your bike down there without no brakes or either your car, because you will, you will feel it. Back in the day, there was no cars allowed to park on Dead Man's Hill. And if you can ride your bike to baseball practice and make it up that hill, you was the man. You were the man if you could make it to the top of that hill. Hey, uh, this is Dead Man's Hill. Trust me, none of those kids should have came down there on their bikes and on their little skates. Now, I've got to tell you about Dead Man's Hill. You see this one here? Right there. See that rock? That's so the car doesn't come down and tear anything up. But I got to tell you, kids used to come down here hit their little bumps and lumps, hit the ground, knees, arms, elbows, and everything. They tore them up. But they get up, we help them out, and they keep it moving, as they say. Hey, this is the hell, dead man's hell. I look up the hill and still get scared of the hell. We used to come up and down this hill, but me being the big guy that I am, I could never walk up this hill. Man, and looking at the hill now, I still can't walk up this hill. Yeah. Greenville National Little League Bayside Park. As you see the field in the background, this is what ledges were made out of. We had the Sabs, we had the Phaetons, we had the Bakers, you had a whole bunch of the Chisholms. He had a whole bunch of people come out of this park. I don't want to leave out Mr. Stokes, them Stokes boys, them Thorpe boys. I mean, it was a whole bunch of people that came out of this park playing baseball, man. Some of them made it to the big league. Can't forget Mr. Kenny Coleman. Cause man, there was some bad gloves back in them days too. With Coleman, Clifford Hauser Jr. Oh man, I could keep going on and on for days. Good experience. You know, you learn to play the competition. Dwayne Saab, um, Dion Butler, those were our leaders. I was fortunate enough to play um, under those two guys as being the leaders in the cap. I coached a lot of teams and they were all special, but that 1983 Raiders team and that All-Star team, those kids were exceptional and it was an honor and privilege to have coached them. Greenville National League Baseball. Greenville National Little League Baseball. Greenville National Little League Baseball. What's up, everybody? I'm Van De Carter, AKA Ice Cream. Bayside Park, Greenville National Little League. Gonna talk about that back in the day. I started back at Bayside Park, back here in 1973. Seven years old, played for a team named Lewis Fryson Plumbing. We were green and white. My number was one. Hey, hey, think about that one. We won a championship. That was 1973. Our coach was a white man by the name of Willie. Willie, I'd like to thank you. I love you. Willie used to come on a Kawasaki motorcycle with a duffel bag, three helmets, four bats, six balls, and catcher's equipment. And that year, ironically, we won the championship. That was 1973, playing with Fryson's Plumbing. That's on Ocean Avenue, 
by Eastern Parkway right over there around the corner. You know, the next year they had a draft. So the next year Willie moved up to the major leagues, by the way. Fryson Plumlin was a minor league team at that time. He moved up to the major leagues. He drafted me, named the team Rado's Laundromat. Corner Armstrong Avenue and Ocean Avenue, right here in Jersey City. Colors was red and white, you know. Everybody back then in the league had powder blue pants. The whole team, major league, minor league, everybody had powder blue pants. And we had jerseys, right, with the little league patches on everything. And our jersey was white with red. So if you washed it incorrectly, it turned pink. So fortunately, my moms knew how to wash clothes correctly. Ma, I thank you for that. But some people's moms wash their jersey in bleach. You know what happened, right? It was pink all over, baby. It wasn't nothing good. This is Fryson. This is Rado's Laundry Mat. 1974. Coach was Willie. My number, number two. I played second base. We didn't win a championship that year, but we was competitive. The team that won that year, and for the next three seasons when I was down there, was First Jersey Bank, which was coached by Bruce Dabney. They always kept a bomb, bomb monster squad. Bank. They was the best team in the league. You know, they were the best team in the league back then and that ever. So I played with Rados from 1974 all the way until 1978 was my last, my last season when I graduated from 34 grammar school. But during my course and my years playing down Bayside Park with Rados Laundromat, I did a lot of things. I accomplished a lot of uh, goals, met a lot of friends. If you play with me down Bayside Park, you are with family, you know. Played with a lot of players. We were grown and raised in Bayside Park, bred it. If you went to 15 school, 20 school, 34, you know Bayside Park, Little League. Rados was my team. I'd like to give a shout out to Stephen Harris, Greg West, <laughs> Frankie, Captain Video. We had two white guys, Bob Bilicek and Jim and John Reedy. Reedy was a catcher, number five. This guy was a great catcher too. Keith Oliver, Ben Gamble, Armin Brown, Alfred Dobson, uh, 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 Billy Dyer, Garnett. And, and, and many, many more that I can't name them all because I only have a short time on this film. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but anyway, keeping the good days good and making it more happier. Everybody always said, Rado suck, but they got the best player in the league. Who was that guy they said? They said it was me. I'm not to my own horn. This is what my peers said, that Van de Carter was the best guy. And we can, how to beat him? Keep this guy off the, off the base path. He's dangerous. He's dangerous. So, we're playing uh, at the bank, then it was Murray Stars. Murray Stars, this is when it was coached by, they used to be Lewis Trucking. So let me give you the rundown of the names of the teams in the league. Minor leagues, we had Frysons Plumbing, Tulo All, Zanzibar, uh, 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 and Vets, in my years. Then we had, we had um, Zim's Kitchen, Mandingo Wig Shop, Lewis Trucking, Rado's Laundromat, First Jersey Bank, IBS, Jeff's Car Wash, Shell Gas Station, Woo, the Dykers, <laughs> Bell's Grocery, you know, it was a lot. We had a lot of talent down Bayside Park. Hello, I'm Ben Gamble. I'm a former player down here at Greenville National. Uh, I played down here uh, in 1975. Uh, I am very excited to be down here. I haven't been down in this particular part of Jersey City in over 20 years. Uh, the field looks great. It's bringing back a lot of memories. Uh, when I played, uh, myself and Paul Chisholm, we were the first uh, eight-year-olds to go right to the majors. Uh, we never played minor league ball. Uh, I played for Rado's uh, Laundry Mat. Paul Chisholm played for, I believe it was uh, Independent, um, the Independent team. Uh, we started with playing with the 11 to 12 years old guys at eight years old, and we was uh, pretty good at our age. Um, when I when we both became 12, we were both the two top players in the league. Uh, this is the time that Murray Stars came up uh, with their young and uh, exciting team. Uh, most of the season was probably going to be between me and Paul for the uh, the, the, uh, the best hitters in the in the in the uh, park. But uh, Murray Stars, they, they played very well and kind of like overshadowed what we did, you know. So I, one of the things that I think about most, we had a game against Murray Stars and I had four home runs in the game. And uh, three of them were grand slams and one with a three-run three home. 
Uh, I hit two off of Derek Bacon. Derek Bacon was young at the time. He was actually eight years old uh, or at nine years old pitching. Uh, Greg Sharperson uh, also was a pitcher, hit one off of him and uh, Cleveland Eatman. So even to this day, I kind of tease Cleveland Eatman about uh, me hitting the home run over him 40 years ago. You know, but what was crazy about that game, uh, I had about 15 RBIs and we still lost the game. You know, so I played with some great guys. Vander Carter was uh, one of my favorite guys. Uh, Keith Oliver, uh, Ronald Johnson, uh, who else is on my team? Mike Allen, uh, uh, Armin Brown. Uh, so played with some really great guys. I had great memories down here. Uh, I can remember my mother sitting right here on these cold slabs here and uh, just sitting here watching the game and never interfering in anything. And the thing that was exciting when I played I, that year was the first and maybe the only time they had an all-star game down here. We played Bergen Lafayette, Nate Kitchens and them. We played them down here and this park was packed. And I remember Rock, uh, Bruce Dabney, well Coach Dabney coached us with the 12-year-olds. And I can remember Rock having like a whole entourage of guys over there on the, uh, on the right field side just cheering all the kids on. And uh, it was a great atmosphere. We ended up winning the game. Uh, I believe the score was 7-5. We moved on to the next round. We go play West New York National up in Hoboken. And we're down 2-1 in the last inning. I get up, I hit a slow roller, I, I outrun it, and I, you know, I get the first base. I steal second, and Marv Johnson, Crazy Horse, gets up and hits a home run that knocks the center field scoreboard out, and we win 3-2. A lot of excitement, never forget that time. I played for Paper National Little League, Team Rados from 76 to 72. Uh, pitcher, catcher, all around position stories. Uh, I think I was one of the better players there, hitting home runs. And... Oh yes, my name is Brian Lane. Yes, uh, I played for Greenville National Little League in 1974 to 1978. And we played, I played on Murray Stars, Greenville National Little League. Yes, to start off with, I didn't even want to come play. My mother brought me down here. She said it'd be a good thing to stay, in, stay involved in the youth stuff. So back then, that was most important for you to get involved. So she brought me down the first year, but every year after that, it was, it was great. I was, I was introduced to a whole bunch of great people. Uh, the first year, we had our orange and purple. It was bad, it was bad. We, was, we stunk big, but when we got our new uniforms, the Rock coaching us, oh man, we was great. We won every year after that. We was great. And then we went on to be all-stars also. We was not only city champs, we got to be county champs also. And we won a lot of trophies. And we did Greenville National League proud. I know I was proud to be a part of it, and it was up there. Mr. Baker was the president at the time, and his wife was the secretary. And we had a great time. Warren also, he was the all-star, and Mr. Dabney all-star coaches, and we went to camp and where we made more friends and we did more damage in the county and we beat everybody. And that was the years that we were in Greenville National Little League. My name is Kelvin Freighton, Greenville National Little League. I started in like 1969, living in Dwight Street. Used to walk out in the park early in the morning, play baseball. My first little baseball was my first game. Woke up like five o'clock in the morning. My mom was yelling, why are you up so early, son? Game time, what time of the game? 10 o'clock, get behind back in bed. So after that, I played a couple years down there. But most of them, yeah, Coach Myers and Coach Hamilton playing baseball, they told me a lot today playing baseball, how to bunt, run, steal, on out the all-star team too. A couple of guys I remember, like John McKeever, started me for his father's down there, helped out a lot. You know, I played all-star games too, we played um, Greenville American, we beat, we beat those guys down there, and another time we played down North Oregon, we lost that game. Yeah, talking plays I know from Greenville National League, like Tom Marley, Tayredos, he's a force. He's a hard throwing fastball pitcher. We had um, Clint Hutchinson, also a pitcher for Bank. We had a Smokey, I forgot his real name. When you, when, you, when you bat against those guys, it's poor smoke. You go at the bat, hoping they don't hit you with the ball. They're little all stars too. So we have the, the families, the Dabney, everybody knows the Dabney is part of the thing. The Chisholm, they was there, and I learned about Chisholm, and the Ashley, we all grew up together going to Bayside Park. It's a well-known name down in Greenville National Little League. It was packed. My aunts was down there, Aunt Viola, my Aunt Hattie, my mother was down there. They all came to watch the game. It was packed. We know, 
Then we have like a foul ball. These can be fairly. We got to go to grand yard, get a foul ball over the French, and then go back and bring the ball back to the field. Now you little. It's like when you're not scared. No, you gotta get the ball. We gotta play the game. Who I, gave Vanda that song? I did. What's the name? Of little it? Vanda Carter. Woo, woo. Benji, bring him home. Bring him home. Bring him home, Benji. I'm on base. <laughs> we all go home. Come on, right here. They have my own song. Little Vanda Carter. Little, little Vanda Carter. <laughs> oh, Larry, I gotta tell a story about Larry Artis. This is the first time Rado's ever had the opportunity and the chance to beat First Jersey Bank. Okay, so we're winning four to three. It's with a home team. It's the bottom of the sixth inning. So Timmy Morris, at this time, Isaac Jones, Ike, how you doing, baby? Him and Dean Lewis were the coach. And Timmy Morris, hey, Timmy, who told me a lot about pitching. He was assistant coach. They were like, yo, how are we going down to second and third? No outs. So it's uh, bottom of the six, four, three, we're winning. Men on second and third, no outs. Tommy Morrison tell him, put Vander in. I told him how to throw some stuff. It's like, all right, well, Vander, I'm on the mound now. Next two batters up for bank. I strike him out, bow, 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 bow. Two outs, second and third. We're still winning four to three, bottom of the six. One batter to go. I don't know who this kid is, right? I don't know who this cat is. So anyway, I got this dude 0-2. 0-2. Oh, now, I know if I throw this three-finger this three finger slider and he chases it, if he hit it, it's nowhere it's going to go. But to first base, I throw the pitch. He hits it. He hits the first base. Now, before there was Bill Buckner and the mishap with the Mets and the Red Sox and the World Series in 1986, there was Larry Artis. Balls hit the Larry Artis at first base. Here it come. Right to Larry. There it goes, right through his legs. Run and score, game's over. Bank wins 5-4, I blew my lid on Larry, you know? I still love you, Larry, but I had to blow my head, it blew my top off. The ball went straight through the legs, his arm was on the ground already. He's seven foot tall. How the hell you missed the ball? Your foot would have knocked that, you got two foot feet. Your foot is size 12. What the hell wrong with you? That guy wound up being a brother that's sitting here we right now today. His name is Troy Ask. So we've been, like I said, we like family. So we hang out sometimes. And he was like, yeah. Yeah, you was the best one on Reno's. I said, yeah. He said, yeah, but nobody couldn't hit you. But I did. I said, you got to hit off me? Like, yeah, I got to hit off you. You always talking about that game with Bank? That was me who hit the ball. I was like, that was an error. He said, well, did it touch his glove? I said, no. He said, well, it's a hit. <laughs> Troy Ashley, where you at, baby? Yes, that was me. Yeah, right. And I wanted to play against the best and hit the best. And he was the best. And I did get a hit. I it still say it was never. It didn't touch <laughs> it. No, no, whatever. Yeah, you got that because it didn't touch his glove. You glove, hear that, Larry, right? You hear glove, that, Larry, right? I'm going to get you, Larry. I still love you. It's a hit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So therefore, yeah, I, I know, got I the hit. only uh -huh. hit. And hey, most important, we won the game. <laughs> See, this guy's and the first. And we became the Vegas. first. <laughs> Bank teams that ever won the districts, and the only team in the district they ever win. So, I think that was a pivotal moment playing against Rados, against him. So, that's <laughs> how I see it. Yeah, that's how you see it. Yeah, I wanted <laughs> to face this guy when he was coming up out of the minors. Know. All I heard about was, hey, this Troy Ashley, Troy Ashley, Black Spikes. Pigeon toe, hey. <laughs> you know, you know, look like an old throwback player. You know, I, I want to face this cat, but I never got the opportunity to face him. But he didn't face me, so I gotta give him that. Gotta give him that. Gotta That's give him. Right. Gotta give it to him. And today we still good <laughs> friends about that. You know, we go back and forth, but I only if we had it on tape. <laughs> <laughs> this brings back memories, boy. I tell you, Bayside Park. Greenville National Little League right here. I used to pitch right there on that very mound. I don't know, I had to be about 10 or 11 years old. Uh, that's when uh, one of my fondest memories is when Cleveland Eatman hit a home run on me. The ball barely went over the, went over the fence. It, I think it hit the fence and then plopped right down. That joker, man. Cleveland Eatman here. Uh, I used to play right on this field with uh, Greenville National uh, Little League. Uh, I think the year is 75 and 76, okay, mid-70s. 
I played for Tulo Oil. I played for um, Murray Stars. Okay, um, <laughs> we played uh, multiple positions, uh, mostly third base. I played a little shortstop. I pitched. I caught some. Okay, did, did a lot of um, did a lot of things. Okay, down here, uh, being down here today is bringing back a lot of memories of uh, my childhood when uh, we actually used to live down in this park. Before we had the tryouts, you know, you thinking you're gonna go there and I'm gonna do good. I'm gonna catch everything, right? I'm gonna hit everything, you know, right? Cause I, I wanna show everybody that, that I can rock, that I can play, All right? So we get down here on Saturday morning and uh, Rock, he called me Cliberto. That was his nickname. He said, Cliberto, come here. Right, so I'm like, okay, I said, what's going on? He said, yo, he said, you better not catch a ball. He said, you better not hit a ball. He said, when you throw, act like you can't throw, right? So I looked at him, I said, I said, what? He said, yeah, he said, don't catch a ball, right? He said, don't hit a ball, act like you can't throw. He said, don't worry, I got you, right? So I'm like, all right, okay, because Rock is my guy, so. I went out there right there, shortstop. I went out there and I let every ball go between my legs. Okay, when when I when I did stop it, I picked it up and I was acting like I was throwing like a girl and stuff. And um, then it was time to hit. It didn't matter where the ball was. If it was down there, I was swinging up here, right? So I'm looking at all the coaches, right? And I think it was like, um, I think uh, Bruce Dabney was down here. Uh, Warren, uh, Springs, um, uh, my memory is escaping me. Um, the shoemaker was one of the guys that was down here. A couple of coaches, like, but you can see them, like, shaking their head, like, man, this kid suck. <laughs> so, I, I'm feeling some kind of way. Alright, but Rock was like, no, nah, I don't work. Alright, but come to find out, Rock had told about five or six other kids uh, to do the same thing, right? So they put us down at the bottom, all right? So Rock was happy because he got all the kids he wanted. He knew he wanted to draft already. So he drafted them, and they was like, you drafted him? Yeah, I got him. You drafted him, right? So, and that was the beginning of the Murray Stars that became the dynasty. We was actually the first team that won the championship. Uh, before they changed to the green and gold, uh, we had the, uh, the orange and orange and purple, or well, orange and purple color uniform. Uh, so I know the, the other team, they looked all pretty with their uniforms. They got jackets and everything. Okay, this still sticks with us today. We didn't get jackets, all right, but we started that all right, with the, uh, that Murray Stars tradition. Coming through Greenville National Little League, I remember my, my mom gave me permission to go down. I had to walk from Wegman to Bayside Park to sign up for the league, and then she came later to give parental consent for me to play. And back then, there were so many kids playing that when you went to try out, they gave you a number. You got, yeah, you had a number from like maybe one through maybe 100 kids trying out. They would have you hit, they would have you field the ball, everything, and all the coaches would stand to the side, and the coach would say, I want number 17. Uh, give me number 35. Uh, give me um, 14. And then if all the other coaches picked your number, then they would have to sit down and say, well, you pick number 18, I want number 105. And it would, that was a, like a draft back in the day. And the coach that picked me was a, a gentleman named DeMar. De He's in that picture. He's in that picture. DeMar, he picked me, and I played for him in the minor league. And I was supposed to play minor leagues for two years, but after one year, they said, send me up to majors. And I played for Coach Rock. I played for him uh, with Mary Stars, the funeral parlor that I alluded to before. And, um, you know, the rest was history. It was all fun. I mean, games would be in the afternoon, sometimes in the morning, but I would be in the park early in the morning all day with my uniform on, waiting to play. It was like a pride thing, you know? You had your uniform. It was like you walk around the city, you had a uniform on, they say, oh, the kid plays sports. What's your fondest memories as a baseball player for Greenville National Little League? Oh, my fondest memory was just being down here every day and creating friends. And, and really not just friends, but be, 
you know, brothers. And I, I've, I made a lot of brothers along the way down here at the park. And it's because of that that you're one of my uncles right Absolutely. now because your nephews was is my brother. You know, we and that's I think that's what it really did for us. You know, it was a real community thing. It was something for the kids to do. It was something for us to get off the block and not just be standing around doing nothing. And we had a lot of coaches, right? And I think that's the most important thing that I could I learned back then is that people cared and people wanted to see other young black people succeed. Absolutely. So would you say you had skills or how did your team do? How was your team down Greenville National? Hey, so you know I played with your brother, your, your brother. So he was our coach. You know he didn't coach okay. losers. So. He's the black Billy Martin. Right. So we always, but we always won. So I mean, we we so out of the six years I played here, we won three championships, wow, that's and we cool. always went to the playoffs and and made it to the championship game. Right. Question: Did you ever? Do you remember leaving out of Jersey City to go play other teams at their field? What did you think once you would leave this area to go play another team's field? I think it. You know, it was uh, kind of an awakening because when you're in your own home. You just never realize how poor you really are. And we was down here, and I'm gonna tell you, we thought we had everything. Right. We thought we had enough to, mm -hmm. you know, to everything we needed was here. But when we would go away, <coughs> excuse me, we would go away and we would see other teams with grass, mm -hmm. with fences, with scoreboards, with billboards. And, and we start yeah. to say, wow, like this is nice. I mean, I remember going to play a team that the outfield was on the water. You know, and, and, it, and it was awakening to let us know that, you know, that we were underprivileged. But even at being underprivileged, we knew we had us and we had everything. And that was more than enough for us to, to really go out there and compete hard and really make us want to win because we wanted to show them just because you have more than us, it don't mean anything. We can out come out here and compete and play with the best. I want to piggyback off that notion, and, and that was basically the reason I would ask you. There was a time in, in the nine and ten year old All Stars. We went to Sea Caucus. We played a night game. At the time, you see, we had beautiful lights, and we didn't have lights, so you right. played in the day, or well, that was it. Oh, we call we it go, a game. We go to Sea Caucus, and it's lights, and for our, our imagination as children, we thought we was at Yankee Stadium, and we got so excited. We got off the bus. And when we got into the game, we beat these kids so bad. The parents was begging the umpires to stop the game. We continued to bat around the order and bat around the order. We had cats who was throwing jokers away, throwing them out from center field to first base. And it was like we would leave places like that. And like you said, we had no idea that we didn't get the things in our neighborhoods at the time that other people had and it didn't even make us a difference because all we had was our imagination and we used it to the best of our ability. That's dope. I'm talking to you, hey, Jersey. I just want to acknowledge all the coaches. Warren Spring, I was a coach, Greenville National Little League, manager, Greenville National Little League, vice president of Greenville National Little League, and president of the Greenville National Little League. Mr. Spring had, 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 had a baseball team that couldn't beat us. <laughs> but he was, he was one of the best coaches down there. Warren and his brother, Rod, were two good coaches. Yeah. <laughs> and um, we, uh, we, we, were, we were good competitors. No animosity. We just had two teams that we just liked playing against playing one hard. another. Playing That's hard. all. Playing, playing hard. hard man. <laughs> That's what it was about. And we hard. developed, you know, we were serious about our coaching because we developed some doggone good athletes. Yeah, we had good skills. We gave them a lot of good skills. A lot of good skills. Yeah. And them kids took that ball and ran with it. No, they played. They played their hearts out. They played the their good hearts. Part is, they were sportsmen. Yes, we, they were. We brought up sportsmen. We brought out, we brought out and brought up athletes and sportsmen. Yes, absolutely. These kids, those kids were were, were, were so fine tuned. Yeah, they were moving well, man. You know, um, we, we had some of the best baseball team, man. I'm what? Ball players, man. That you would, most people wouldn't believe because a lot of them we had since they were yes eight nine years old. That's right. And then. 
lot of those that we taught whatever we knew mm -hmm. and whatever they learned at other places, mm -hmm. they, they turned out to be great kids. They were, you know, great they, athletes, respectable. Yes, they, they um, went out and got beautiful jobs and with the manners they were taught and the exactly and the um, just the. Um, basic life skills that we gave up. It was, it was pretty decent. I loved it. And it, loved it. it was something that was necessary for not just their athletic growth, but for their, for their, for their what can I say, their manhood. Like you just said, yeah. it developed that character, a, man. a character. That character man, they, they developed character because like I said earlier, we didn't just teach sports. No, 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 no. That was, that's the truth. And got to tell you, when you see them now, do you hear what I hear? Yeah. Mr. Hager. That's right. You know, <laughs> Mr. No, no, that means they had to appreciate it, what uh, what they learned here. Yes, sir. And they called all the ladies that were with us, Miss, yes, Mrs., yes, whatever. Yes. It was all about, you know, it was about life experience, which turns out to be a lot more than baseball for most of them. For most of them, yes. Most of them. But hey, it turned out, which is what I would really appreciate. Mm -hmm. about. Only the, the, they were proud of us too. Yeah, I think so. You know, to come down here, man. I'm my coach is such and such, yeah. and play their hearts out. <laughs> I mean, down. No, hey, I know. Down 10, 11 points. Yeah, there come is back. no last inning. No, let's go. And we were just talking about um, all the things that what happened to make the league do what it do. You know, just to keep it going. The uh, fundraisers going out shaking the cans, going to the grocery stores, asking people, please help me with the National Little League. And we got a good response for that. You know, maybe Bruce could tell us a little bit more about that. Well, you know what, what people don't realize, you have to you have to get permission to do that. So we had to go meet with the executives and get a time frame. You just can't go shake cans. Right. You have to you have to coordinate that. And Mr. Smith and Mrs. Smith, they were, they were very instrumental in that. And we would go sit down with the executives at bank and whatever. And of course, shaking cans, that's just a little bit of it because you need a lot to buy those uniforms and to pay for umpires. People don't realize you you got to pay for these umpires mm -hmm. if you want to get good umpires, you know? Right. So we, we shook cans, but the big thing was the fish fries. We actually go out to Montauk, catch the fish, this will make the hush puppies. We would then have the corgis and we, we would make a lot of money. We would make maybe $10,000 on a fish fry. Wow. People would show up for that because yeah. it's food, you know what I'm saying? But they would, right. we would get them to to volunteer for committees mm -hmm. because you know part of literally you gotta have people behind you. That's right. where the mothers came. Yeah. Some of the fathers, but mostly the mothers did all that work. Yeah. So the fathers coached and they, mm -hmm. they went on about their business. Right. But the mothers made sure the uniforms were always clean. Mm -hmm. They were always there. They they showed up to be chaperones at the fundraisers. So you, right. you know when we're raising funds, you gotta have somebody there at the store. Yeah. So that's how we were able to to subsidize really. Then we would go to the city, ask them for some things to keep the field up. Right. Sometimes they did. Sometimes they did. Right, right, right. Uh, we had great players down here, but they just had to be disciplined. And that was my job to discipline my players. I had my son Tony Perkins down here playing. He was my shortstop. And uh, I had a lot of great players over the years. Um, I think, I'm not sure, I think I'm the first one down here to win a district championship. And I had a great team. Uh, Ashley Walker and, and Bernard Palmerly and just just a bunch of great kids doing some great things. Um, I don't know how it is now. If they have one tenth of what we did down here, they're in good shape because it was just it was just good stuff. There were a lot of great coaches down here. There were just a lot of great people putting in a lot of time. Um, I spent most of my time down here. I, I lost money coming down here to, to coach because. I couldn't wait to get down here to coach. I was playing at that time. Uh, I think at that time I was just coming out of the, the minor leagues team and uh, I was with uh, a softball team, the Traveling A's, myself and Harry Elliott. And we would come here before our games and coach and, and he would go and I would stay and I would go and he would stay. And uh, we just broke it up so we could get to our games and um, get down here and coach and work with the kids. Um, it was a great time for me. I kind of, I kind of love it. Um, just coming down here brought back a lot of great memories, a lot of good times. Yelling at the kids, <laughs> getting them right, and teaching them the game. I was taught on a professional level, so that's how I taught my kids on a professional level. We did drills and stuff uh, that probably no one else was doing because no one else knew how to do them. I, I guess I don't know, but I always believed that when you have young kids, their minds were open 
and they were open to anything that I would give them. And that's what they did. I would give them big time stuff. They didn't realize it at the time uh, because I was taught big time stuff. And uh, I just passed it on to the kids. Uh, we didn't talk ga ga goo goo. We talked like men. And uh, we got it right. Everybody knew where to go at the snap of a finger. Everybody knew where to go when I turned around and looked at them. And, and that's the way we rehearsed it. We planned it. And uh, I'm a big believer in practice and, and, and rehearsing. I do the same thing with my group Soul Generation. We rehearse, we practice, and we get right for the event. Because as long as you stay right, you'll always work. You know, and as um, long as you stay right on the baseball field, most of the time you'll win. I'd really like to thank my pops for even taking me off the porch and exposing me to such, such, such talented uh, atmosphere. You know, a lot of people thought it was nepotism because my pops was my coach in, in, the, in the minors and on to the majors when I played for Murray Stars. A lot of people thought it was nepotism, but my skills show and prove and show that I belonged where I was at with those all-stars like John Stokes, Derek Baker, Slip Hampton, and we played against the Detroit Ashleys and, and the Adrian Thorps and the Gerald Thorps and all of those guys, man, to name a few. But it's so many, the Brian Coleman's, the Jimmy Jenkins, the Anthony Leggett's. It was serious. The Alfred Dobson's, Ferrados, and all those good teams, man. And I thank my pops, you know, because he showed me a lot. We weren't just learning basic baseball. We was learning professional things at a young age. And... It just was so inspiring and, and grateful, and I'm thankful for him for even bringing me down here and exposing me to that. Hi, how you doing? My name's Stanley Haygood, and uh, I am a former baseball coach here at Greenville National Little League. I coached here for approximately 12 years, and I had one of the best experiences that anyone could ever have in being around a lot of kids. I not only was a coach, but I also was a mentor because I then began to see what was transpiring in some of their lives. I used to, used to take them out up to the White Castle after a game and buy them food. We had a lot of fun. My sons played baseball here and they were very successful. When I, when, when I started. Now, uh, Craig Brown was, uh, was one of my closest friends and still is, and I introduced him to the aspect of coaching Little League Baseball. I went from here to coaching high school baseball. And the funny thing about all of that is all the, all the ball players that played Little League Baseball ended up being dispersed throughout all the high schools in Jersey City. They all knew one another. We played against ball players who became professional ball players and they pretty much all started either here, downtown, or up in our rival area which was Greenville American. We played against them, we played against West New York, Union City, uh, sea Caucus. We played against a lot of teams surrounding our area, but our most successful team played in the state championship down in, in, in Atlantic City, of which my youngest son was the second baseman, who almost won the MVP of the tournament. Wish we had won that one, otherwise we'd, they'd have been playing uh, in the Little League World Series, but they dropped that and it was a close game. One of my best memories was uh, one year, I mean, we had a, our team was sorry, and, you know, we were trying to win our first game. I think we were about 0-9 or 0-10, and, and we were playing um, um, Banks, who was the best team in the league. And I remember I'm on third base. It was a tie score last inning. I think it was one out. And the batter hit the ball to the outfield. Um, so I had to tag up at third base. So when the outfielder caught the ball, you know, I had to um, try to beat the throw so that we could finally get our win. And... Uh, the catcher was, was DeMont Lewis, 
who's like, you know, to this day, one of my best friends. And I had to run him over in order to win that game. And I saw, I remember seeing the ball come past me as I'm running toward the home plate. The ball got in his glove and I just tucked my head and ran him over and he dropped the ball and we finally got our first win. Bruce, uh, can you tell us about um, how far the uh, all-star teams and the championship teams, as far as citywide and county and statewide, how far did they go? Well, you know, before you got to that point, you had to make sure that you, you had the selection process, particularly for the all-star team. Now, the city championship teams were your regular league teams, so were the champions of the league. Right. And uh, we won a couple of those city championships, Bank did, uh, and uh, other teams went, got close to winning it. Mm -hmm. uh, and in terms of the all-star team, that was a very difficult uh, uh, selection process because you had to you had to make sure you chose to, 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 the players for each skill position, and they, right. they merited it, not on nepotism. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 kids from every team were, were chosen, and we got almost to, uh, to winning the, the, the regional, but we got the game against Seacall because all of a sudden we were ahead 4 nothing. Uh, ground ball to Greg West, mm -hmm. double play ball. He tagged the guy. Umpire said he didn't, and then that, that started. Mm -hmm. Then the, the strike zone started to change, you yeah. know. But the, our kids, I our, think I was yeah, there that day. Remember too. that? <laughs> our kids hung in there, and uh, you know it took all of me to, to, to keep it calm because if, if I had shown any animosity toward the umpire, it would it would have gotten out of hand. Right. And I knew what was going on. You know, mm -hmm. we weren't supposed to be there, right. but the, our talent was there. Uh, the, the kids were, were fa fantastic. But it was it was a, it was a, a selection process. So once we came into the league, because before we got here, very few black kids were even being chosen for the All Star team. Right. So once we did that, it, uh, Greenville National really did well. We upset West New York, who was favorite to beat us. Mm -hmm. And when I remember a kid hit a home run. Jones hit one out of the park on a curveball, and we won with a walk off home run. Who was that, Marvin Jones? Marvin Jones. Buffalo. He, Buff, what's he up, hit, baby? He hit one out. I remember I pulled him over to the side. I said, remember the last time he threw that curveball? Mm -hmm. He's going to hang it again. Right. Tear it up. Pow, and yeah. we won. And that was it. Headlines in the newspaper. Right. Uh, Greenville National upsets West New York. So I was mentioning the fact that there was a particular team that was a, a, a all-star team that played in in the league and won that league, and they went down to Atlantic City and stayed there for a week. If they had won that game. They'd have been in Pennsylvania uh, and participating. We would have been, yeah, we would have been participating in, in the World, Little League World Series. Mm -hmm. I, at least won a ticket. Preliminary. Preliminary yeah. to get into yeah. that. That's what I remember. Yes. Yeah. And it was a boy, I'm telling because Steve was the second baseman. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no problem. Was, yeah. This is how it went. And, and that's how it went. And Steve being the second baseman, and, and as I remember, supposedly, he was supposed to be given some kind of accolade for being an MVP of that particular tournament. And I can't remember the name of that team because they were a powerhouse yeah, in Atlantic good. City. Very good. And I think they may still, not the team, but the, the league. They're still a, a, a pretty powerhouse. Now, I don't know whether they still exist. I'm not sure. Right. But I can tell you um, where we were. We were, it was the sectionals. Mm -hmm. That's what it was. It was the sectionals. I'm Mike Goins. I coached in Greenville National Little League from 1978 to 1983. I, uh, let's see, I think I started with the Dikers. We won the 79 championship. Now, in 79 with the Vidikas, that was considered a, a minor league team. In little leagues, you had the minor leagues, which is basically eight, nine-year-olds or, or the younger kids first starting out. Uh, we battled against, I think it was Tulo All and my buddy Sam and his team. We, uh, we had some classic games and uh, wound up that neither one of us could one, we each won a game and then we played a game, a third game and wind up in a tie so the league's decided okay you're going to share the championship and uh, but it was great and from that uh, I worked with the, uh, in those days they had what they call friendship games and we took uh, uh, some minor league kids and we played against like Secaucus and things and we had success with that, uh, there were unofficial tournaments so to speak and the following year, 
I went up to Rados, which was the major league team. That first year, well, we didn't win a lot of games, but we were competitive. And I worked with uh, Harry Hilliard and Cliff Perkins on the all-star team. Uh, I was kind of the third wheel. I wanted to uh, get some tournament experience and helping to prep the kids for uh, a higher level as, as it goes in Little League. So I think I was the outfield coach that year. And one of the things I said, well, we're going to put in a backup system for the outfielders because every time the ball is hit, my philosophy is everyone moves. You just can't have the infielders moving around. The outfielders standing there looking at the action. And sure thing, it came into play in one of the games where it was an overthrow at second from left field to second base. And the right fielder was in position to cut that ball off and keep the runner from advancing. So uh, I was very proud. I, I don't know why I remember that, but, but I do. And, we had the nine and ten year old tournament started up, which is the all star for just the district, which is basically Hudson County. Uh, the Bakers selected me to be the coach for the uh, nine and ten year old all star team. Now, for the most part, no one paid a lot of attention to them because our regular all star team was loaded and we had high expectations for them, but none on these nine and ten year olds. Well, the big team. Had a good run, but they fell short. But that nine and 10 year old team came back, won the whole thing. And I told other coaches in the league is we wanted to keep uh, the players in positions like Barry Graves played third base, Travis Enos was shortstop, uh, Stevie Haygood second base, Ferris Toon was on that team, Brian Coleman was the catcher. And I, I think Lance Feld was there, but we wanted them to, to play those same positions on their regular league teams because by the time they're 12 years old, it, it would just be beneficial to the league as a whole and for them as individuals, which was done. And two years later, well, we'll get to that, but two years later, they, they, they turned it around and came back and uh, not only did they win the, uh, the uh, district championship, but they also went on to play New Jersey North Section 2 title, which was the first in Jersey City team to ever win that, that, that title there. Okay, now in 1982, uh, I coached Rados. That was my regular league team, and uh, we had an undefeated regular season, and you know we, we got through that there, and I was selected as the all-star coach for the uh, little league team, and the uh, Cliff Perkins was my assistant. Now I had the utmost respect for Cliff because I learned a lot from him. And we went on, we got to the finals in that game we, and uh, we fell short. Now, <clears throat> although we fell short, we weren't cheated. We didn't get, get, get a, a bad job from the umpires. It was nothing. We simply say, you know what? That day, that team played one run better than we did, and we live with that, okay? But our kids were really good. Now, the catch to that was those nine and 10-year-olds from two year, a year prior to that, a lot of them were on that team. Some of them didn't get to play that year, but they were part of the team. And again, it was all part of a developing process that we went through. Now, the next year, again, my Raiders team happened to have a win the league championship. And I think my buddy at the time, Harry Hilly, he got mad at me because the last game of the season, I decided, you know, my kids had, you had a great year. It's your game. I let my assistant coach run the team. I let people like uh, Brian Coleman beg me, oh, yeah, let me bat left-handed. So, uh, okay, I'm going to let you bat left-handed today. And uh, I let kids, it was a fun day. Whether we won or lost the game was never important, okay? And... I think uh, my son Michael was a nine-year-old on that team. I think that was his, he got to pitch that game and we developed in players uh, uh, and, and we lost that particular game. And Harry was mad at me because he says, oh, why'd you, throw, why'd you do that? I said, I didn't throw the game, I just let my kids have some fun. He was like, yeah, I understand that, but you know, because they won, now I finished third instead of second. You know, I thought that was funny, you know. But, <laughs> Okay, now in 83, after we won the district uh, championship, you played for the sectionals, which was the uh, basically North Jersey title. 
The first game we played, there was the two games. You had to win two games to get out of, out of the section to go to the state finals. The first game we played uh, a team from uh, Callstad, I believe it was. <laughs> they were really good, okay? And this was gonna be a tight game, and they had outstanding pitching, and so did we. And now two things happened in that game. First of all, my, my center fielder was on first base, and a ground ball was hit to, to uh, let's say, shortstop, and he's forced now. You teach the kid, you run to the base, you're a fourth split, you slide to the base, directly to the base. He did that. The second baseman or shortstop stood on the back. He had plenty of time to move, never moved, so he got knocked down. They threw my center fielder out of the game. Now I'm asking him, well, why? He didn't go out the baseline. The kid should have just you know, stepped off, but okay. And then two, Brian Coleman <laughs> had been showing me what his brother, you know, his brother played professional baseball, had been showing me in practice how his brother showed him how you can go back to first base standing up. I said, well, Brian, we don't do it that way. We're going to do it my way, right? So what he decided to do in the game was to go in standing up, He's safe, and then the kid pushed him off the bag, and the umpire called him out. And I was like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> you know? And again, lessons learned. We're going to do things my way. But anyway, we won that game, and the next game we had to play with Berto Clemente from Essex County. I couldn't go see them play, so Harry Hilliard went out to scout them. He came back, his scouting report said that they have two big left-handed kids who can mash the ball. One of them pitches, but he pitched the game there so we wouldn't see him. And the other one basically threw right-handed, batted left-handed. He says, but they're hitting with a big, thick black bat that cannot be Little League approved. In those days, Little League had to have the Little League uh, uh, seal of approval on the bat. So when we show up to the game, the first thing I did was decide uh, I was going to make a lineup change. I was going to throw two lefties at him because this team had never seen left-handed pitching. So I threw Luke Griffith for three innings because he would get any team out for three innings and that's exactly what he did. And then Donald Mitchell came in and he threw bullets and shut them down for three. But in the meantime, the first reaction was the umpire, I go to the umpire, I go, please check my bats because I want to make sure everything is legit here. I don't want a problem. And once he checks mine, he has to check the other teams. As soon as he saw those bats, he threw them out the game. We just took them out of their game mentally because they started crying and complaining that they can, why can't we use that bat? And we survived that game and went on to the state championship uh, round. All right, I'm Sam Kelly. Uh, used to coach Greenville National Little League. Team was uh, Tulo Oil. It was a minor league team. Ages that I had were from uh, age seven to about 10 and then they would graduate and go into the majors. And uh, it was a beautiful thing because what happened is that you had communication with, with the uh, children that didn't get a lot of communication at home. And uh, one day we played a game and after the game we would always sit down and talk about the game, whether it was bad, good, win or lose. And so this one particular time we lost this game so I was trying to figure out, asking all these different questions to the kids, and then one thought come to my mind. How many of y'all guys had something to eat this morning? Raise your hand. One fourth of the team raised their hands. Three quarters of the team didn't have anything to eat. Now what happened is that they really couldn't perform because it was 85 degrees out. And you understand, nothing on their stomach, and they had no energy. And I told him, look here, you know where I live at? Anytime you get up, wash up, get dressed, you don't get nothing to eat, come to my house. Come through the side door, and it'll be cereal on the table. And believe it or not, Saturday morning, I would have half of my team having breakfast at my house. Hi, my name is Travis Toon. I played here at Greenville National Little League from 79 to the uh, early 80s. Um, I play for Tulo Oil and also Rado's Laundromat. I'm here along with my coach, my first coach, who introduced me into baseball, Mr. Sam Kelly. Uh, I played for Mr. Kelly. He was my first introduction of having a organized, a structured baseball in my life. Um, he brought me a long way. Um, I guess what I could say I learned here at um, Greenville National Little League is that we had it had something for everybody. 
You could basically, if you were in need of a father figure, they found your father figure. If you needed a, the atmosphere of just camaraderie and being around friends, they had that as well. Um, after I left Mr. Kelly, after winning a co-championship against uh, the Dakers in 79, I played for him a little longer. I had a stint with Murray Stars, uh, the late Bird Walker. I played for him for a little while. And um, he just he felt I didn't have what it takes. So he sent me back down to Mr. Kelly. And uh, on one Saturday, I made my debut. And everybody knew that uh, I had a, a decent right arm. So from there, I played in the 10-year-old All-Stars. And we won the district. And I was introduced to Mr. Michael Goins. Mr. Goins brought me first. Mr. Kelly introduced me. And he... Uh, showed me the rough edges in the beginning, but Miss, uh, Mr. Goins, he polished uh, everything and made me the complete player that I went on to be. We won some tournaments, some district, and uh, I just want to correct Troy Ashley. Later on down the line, he may have won the first district, but uh, we won the district and the sections. We went on to compete for a state title. I appreciate Mr. Goins now, Mr. Mike Goins now more than when he was coaching me. I didn't understand some of the things when he was, some of the things he was teaching when he was being a little rough, I thought at times, but he was easy to play for as time moved on. He, he demanded you give just as much as he gave. He didn't like a dollar nonsense. He'll, that hand on the hip, that head will start leading to the side and he'll let you know you screwed up, let's get it right. But I appreciate him more now. I think about what he has done to impact my life now as a father, as a man who gets up and go to work every day to make a living. Mr. Goins was uh, dedicated. He always brought, brought his kids around. That's something I did when I first had my kids and they were little. Um, Mike and Kareem would be around. They would be around as he, wherever he went with the baseball and things where, where they could come, they would be there. And um, I took that, I implemented a lot of what Mr. Goins gave me to, into my life now as a, an adult male. Let me say that uh, I coached a lot of teams and they were all special. But that 1983 Raiders team and that All-Star team, those kids were exceptional, and it was an honor and privilege to have coached them. Fireway, whatever you want to know, I'm here to tell you about how great our Little League was. Okay, um, Brian, give us a little insight on how you started, how you got started, and who made you start. Okay, so uh, my brother started down here, and my dad was coaching. Uh, Champagne actually coached with my dad, right? So. Uh, my brother started down here. I think I think they say he was the first nine-year-old to make it to uh, the major leagues. Just go straight to the majors. Um, and Kenny was down here, had a good career down here. And uh, when he was on his way out, I was on my way in. Um, so that's really how I got started down here. And it was a community thing. So everybody from the community, this is where they went. You play sports. You play baseball down at Greenville National. So what's the name of the teams you played on? All the teams. Um, I played on. I can't remember what little minor league team I played on, but I played for the uh, the great Rados in, in the majors. So if I had to tell a story about any player that I want, it probably would have to be Dwayne Sab. And, uh, Dwayne Sab played, we played together at Rados, and we really had a, a, a dynasty at the time we were down here. Um, but Sab was uh, the Shaquille O'Neal of our little league. He was uh, dominant, strong, um, hit a ton of home runs. Um, we were great friends growing up, uh, hanging out down at this park. Um, but if I had to say a guy who kind of made an impact on me was sad just with his um, his work ethic, how hard he worked. He was also smart in school, so that was uh, a big thing for me too. That was an influence, you know. Had to be smart in school as well as, you know, good in athletics. Um, and uh, we went two years in a row, undefeated two years in a row. Uh, we lost in the city final as, when I was 11, he was 12, and then when I was 12, we actually won the city final, so we went undefeated all the way through uh, as 12-year-olds. Yes, this is Raheem Muhammad. I'm with Tony Perkins. I want to ask you a question, Tony. What was that inspired you and in interest in the Green Girl the league? It, I have to give all the credit to my father. He exposed me to all of this. You know, as a, as a kid, you know, I was... Uh, just an athlete, period. You know, just born athlete. And uh, he exposed me to Greenville National Little League. You know, we came down here as a kid and we would practice every single day. 
every single day. And it was just a great experience just to go against guys that were so talented other than myself. And I just got to give all the credit to my pops. That's great. Cliffy, Cliff, you're, on, you're on doing your job there, Cliff. Yeah, yeah. Many years. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, so, okay. We have a, a, a void in what the sports have to give kids today. Uh, you, me, and everybody else, we're older, and we know what that family feel of, of growing up as, as a child. You're seeing guys, you know, in the mindset you're already thinking about when you see them, when we play baseball, basketball, football, we don't have none of that now. We have it, but it's not as prevalent and strong as it was back then. What do you think we could do? I just think we have to, you know, expose these children to a lot more like baseball. You know, they're so caught up in just basketball and football, like they don't really realize how important baseball is. And it's probably one of the highest paying professional sports that you can be a part of. You know Last what I mean? too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But baseball, you know, it's, it's less contact. You know, you can play longer, more longevity in baseball. And just having Greenville National Little League and just have it up and running like it did back in the day, I just think it takes, you know, more, um, more resources more resources from the city, more uh, parent participation and coming down and supporting their, ch their children like, like we had. And it's just very important, but we have to bring baseball back and start pushing baseball more because these kids are really missing out. As a adult male now, what did Greenville National Little League Baseball do for you as a adult right now today? Oh, look, looking at where you came from then to now. Oh, Rainbow National was, was, was very inspiring for me, you know, and it did a lot for me in my life today because it taught me how to how to work with others, how to be a team player, not just to be selfish and just worry about me, how to be, how to be a, a team player and just encourage others to do better, you know, us standing in the dugout and stuff like that, cheering each other on. And it's good, it helped me because now a lot of players that I went against and played against I'm good friends with now. So it taught me to be a great winner, a great loser, and it's just life skills. Yeah. Competitor. Really competitor, <laughs> always a competitor. <laughs> but just to respect other people, you know, and treat people with respect and be competitive at the same time and just love each other. That's, that's, that's pretty much it for me. Scott Goins, I played for Rados 1982, Major League. Um, we were 16 and old, coached by my um, older brother, Mike Goins. We had the most dominating infield in Greenville National during that year. Uh, three of my teammates went on to play professional sports, so that gives you sort of an idea of the talent that we had in Greenville. Um, I remember precisely because the city would never take care of Bayside Park. You talk about the ripped, torn dugouts, uh, dirt patches in the infield, rocks, you know. It, under them conditions, our skills was up because every morning we would go to each other's house, 8, 9 o'clock, let's go, when we get at this baseball thing. And that was our ritual. So we really thought and believed like we were professional players, and it really manifest by the time we got down to the park. Um, again, I was saying on Rados, the team that I played on in 1982, Within our league, we were 16 and 0. I played with some of the most dominating baseball players at that time. You're talking about Dion Butler. Dion Butler had an unstoppable fastball. I mean, he would record 10 to 12 strikeouts per game. That was his average. You weren't getting more than two, three hits when he got up on the mound. Ferris Toon. Ferris Toon was a little younger than us, but Ferris as well would dominate. I had infielders like Dwayne Sab. The cleanup hitter, Dwayne Sab went on to be, have an NFL career with the Patriots. I had a Nardo Webster Jr. in right field, and he and he was kind of raw, like he wasn't as talented as he would become. But you kind of get the gist of the talent that came up out of Greenville National in Bayside Park. So we lived in a glorious time, man. And as kids, we had no ideas that when we would go play other leagues. They would have fields that was manicured like Yankee Stadium. 
and we would dominate them so bad the parents would beg for mercy they was like please stop the game stop the game it's in the fourth inning it's 17 and nothing it's 18 and nothing we running around bases like Carl Lewis like they they couldn't believe the speed and the, the ambition that we played with it was like it was an exciting time and um you know, it's something that you definitely didn't want to miss. In Greenville National, all the baseball teams were sponsored by the businesses in the town. Black-owned businesses, white-owned businesses, it didn't matter. You had uh, Tulo, Tulo Oil, a team was sponsored by them. Rado's Car Wash, Jeff's Car Wash. Remember that? Jeff's Car Wash was a black-owned business. Um, First National Bank. That was Banks, Murray All-Stars. That was Murray's funeral home. And 90% of them businesses that sponsored these baseball teams was black businesses. You understand what I'm saying? So the legacy that we had here in Greenville in the midst of 2018 is, is the gentrification. You don't have the same support. The teams that I played for were Zanzibar, uh, Caesars Palace, if anybody remembers this. Also played for um, Jeff's Car Wash, um, Bus Stop Lounge. Um, a lot of good times down here in Bayside Park. Met a lot of friends. Many of them are still my friends. Uh, some of the players that I enjoy playing with were uh, Steve Baines, Derek Baker, um, Joel Majors, Dave Brown, uh, played against Vander Carter, uh, Slip, Tyrell Hampton, his younger brother, John John, uh, Ivan Jackson, coached by the legendary Coach Jackson. He had uh, Murray Stars. Everybody and their mother wanted to play for Murray Stars. But that's another story. During uh, my senior year down here at Greenville, played for uh, Harry Hilliard, and Jeff Carwash A's, assistant coach, Angie Champagne. She was a good coach. Whenever, you know, Coach Harry couldn't make it, she let us through everything that we had to go through. Um, that's the same year that I broke my ankle, sliding into third base. But uh, it was all good, though. We had a lot of fun down here. started out in the minor leagues. I was with Tulo Oil. I was eight years old. I played different positions. I played first base, outfield. You know, I was, I was a pretty good ball player. You know, I could have been a little bit better. And then on my second year, I thought I was going to play another year in the minors, but they brought me up to the uh, major leagues. And in the major leagues, I was, you know, like nine years old, playing with some of the guys like, you know, uh, Walker Lee Ashley, Gerard Wims, uh, Dwayne Williams. You know, we had a couple of good white guys that played at the time. You know, Dale Skursky, uh, Bobby Schroeder, Chris Johnson, also uh, Clint Hutchison. You know, those were the teams. The teams back then were uh, Rados, uh, J.C. Print. Zimp's Kitchen, and uh, when I played, I, uh, we had good ball players. Like I said, I played outfield, first base. You know, we had good coaches. Uh, I can't really think of the coaches that I played for at the time, uh, but they were good guys, and you know, they helped us with our fundamentals, and the best thing they taught us was about teamwork and togetherness. You know, whether you win or lose, you know, you go in as a team and you go out as a team. You know, and that was the best part of it. Like I said, the camaraderie was the most important thing. During the uh, winters, you know, we had our Little League dinners, you know, where we got our jackets and our trophies, so we got to see everybody then. And, you know, then it was time to come back again for baseball season. Yeah, my name is Wade Smith. I coached Little League down here from the late, probably, 80s until the 90s. Uh, I love coaching down here, get the kids off the street. Uh, my two boys played down here. That's what got me down here coaching. I brought my two boys down here to play. And that thing I know, I was coaching down here. And I coached down here for about 12 years before I decided to stop. But it was a good job, and I loved doing it. Jackie, back then it was uh, Greenville National, but now it's Jackie Robinson. And it's a league that flourished because a lot of kids had something to do over the summer. And I loved the league back then, and I still love the league now. And now anything needs to be done, you can call on me to help. After I became a coach down here, I finally got a chance, opportunity to coach the All-Stars. I coached with Craig Brown, and Craig Brown one of the best and most knowledgeable baseball coaches that I ever coached with. Uh, I learned a lot from him. Uh, hard worker, made the kids work hard. 
But now, but in the end, Craig Brown is one of the greatest coach Greenwood National has ever had. Craig Brown, former coach of Greenville National Little League, and a player back in the day. We back in the day at Greenville National Little League. What you see here is our baseball field. Back when I played, Greenville National had this field. Greenville American had the second field. We alternated days. Uh, Greenville National at the time didn't have a lot of black kids in the league. Myself, Cliffy Perkins, Ronald Rim, Ralph Holmes, and this is someone else. It's just I didn't retain it, but it was all, it wasn't only but a couple of us in the league at the time. When I coached, it was all black. It was a great time. We had kids looking forward to playing baseball. We had kids that couldn't wait for baseball season to start. We had sponsorship from the local businesses in our neighborhoods. And the great thing about it, we had the parent participation. We used to have a parade, opening day parade. Angie, Miss Geach, I know you remember the parade. See, I'm talking to Miss Geach too, like she's right next to me, but she's not. One of the other guys that coaches, really good coaches that I failed to mention was Wade Smith. Both his sons played baseball. Wade Jr. was an exceptional baseball player. I had retired from coaching and I came back to help Smitty coach his kids. Uh, Greenville National should be like the television show on BET, Unsung, because it helped so many kids. It kept them off the streets. It provided something positive and it provided discipline to be around other kids and other adults that were not their parents, not their mothers and fathers and uncles. And Ange, like I told you what I said at one time at one of our dinners, it would behoove parents to come down and see who their kids are around. So you develop that trust and that security of understanding not just what we're doing, because a lot of times parents want to know why the kids wasn't starting or playing. You had to trust the coach's judgment, but you need to come down and see maybe why your kid wasn't starting to play as much, because a lot of kids were afraid of the ball. How you doing? My name is Anthony Sports Sharperson. I grew up a few short blocks away from here, Wegman Parkway, um, and this was my park, Bayside Park, um, and it became my park via Greenville National Little League. I started out when I was seven years old uh, with Tulo All. Then I moved on to First Jersey Banks with Craig Brown. Um, my first coach was Ted. He used to work for, uh, I believe, Tulo All. And again, like men like that um, who sacrificed and gave their time up, um, it meant a lot to me. Um, it actually shaped me um, into the man that I am today. Um, the commitment that they showed, um, perseverance coming down here, brought the equipment, picked up the kids, uh, would bring us home, make sure we ate. Um, that gave me a sense of community. Um, it was a safe haven for me. Um, I actually thrived down here. Um, you can't have a name like sport without being good at something, and baseball was one of those sports that I was actually good at. Um, and, and I guess back then, 60s, 70s, early 80s, um, a lot of black men, we thrived in baseball. And then as time progressed, we sort of moved away from it because it's a little harder to keep uh, baseball teams together as they start traveling. Um, and that sort of happened to me. Um, I, became a member of the Jersey City All-Star team, um, but then I lost my peers, my neighborhood peers. It was like I was one of few, and it was guys from other parts of town. We were traveling. I still was good. I still represented for Bayside Park. When I was playing in Little League on Tula Wall, I aspired to play for First Jersey Bank. So when uh, Craig Brown drafted me uh, the First Jersey, that was like one of the happiest days of my life as a, a eight or nine year old when I was going to play in um, the majors and play for First Jersey. That was the team to play for. It was either that or the Dakis Delhi or the Vikings, but I knew I wanted to play for Craig Brown because he always seemed like a good man. 
Um, he took care of his kids. He would just make sure that we would, were safe. He made sure that we were taken care of, uh, whether it was food, whatever the case may be. He tried to show us um, different things. He owned Whispers right up the street. Um, he would take us around, take us outside the neighborhood um, and make those connections uh, from childhood to adulthood. And um, to, to this day, he's still a friend of mine, a dear friend, and I look to him for advice um, because he's always been rock solid in my life and that's how he was down here. He gave us all and I'm sure he gave us all in every facet of his life. Okay, so I wasn't the best pitcher, but um, that was a position I played um, because I was one of the, the more better athletes on the team. And what was taught to me was that as a pitcher, you gotta hone in and focus. Um, you gotta make every box, every thought, every sight that you see sort of small and you have to block everything out. As, as, as if I'm looking into this camera right now, nothing else matters but that, that glove where that catcher wants me to put that ball. And then obviously my delivery, the setup, um, everything that goes into that, it has to be consistent um, because you can lead to a lot of balks in life when you try to veer off the path um, and do something different. So pitching is about being consistent and about extreme focus and that's what you have to do as a picture. Um, another position I played was uh, third base, which I loved the most, um, and that's where I started out at. Um, third base, usually you're putting a bigger guy with a stronger arm, um, who could catch, but not as good as a shortstop or maybe a second baseman. Um, but again, a third baseman, like you're only dealing with usually from right to left, you, you know, a few times you may have to do a backhand uh, down the line, but more or less your mobility is more moving towards your left and then obviously you're strong enough to make that throw down to the first base. Um, playing shortstop, usually as a low league guy, shortstop is reserved for the best athletes. Um, so I was interchangeable between third base and shortstop when somebody else you know, proved himself, Craig would move me around or whatever the case may be. But at shortstop, you gotta be the leader. Um, that teaches you that team camaraderie, um, how to coordinate people, how to call out how many strikes, how many outs, um, to tell a picture of what the batter might be doing or whatever. Um, as a shortstop, your lateral movement has to be there. Um, and again, you're sort of coordinating the whole team as the shortstop because you're the man in the middle and predominantly you're gonna get the most balls hit at you and the most action besides the pitcher and the catcher. But you're, you're the coach out there on the field typically as the shortstop. Um, so again, I took pride in all those positions and I tried to be the best at whatever it was that was thrown my way. And whenever somebody gave me something, I tried to honor that. Um, and again, the men that sort of held this park down for years, um, the consistency and like I said, the perseverance that they showed, I tried to give it right back and not let them down. I wanted to win everything. Neil, what was the most that you got out of playing out of Greenville National Little League? Uh, it gave me a sense of pride, you know. Um, it also uh, made me be a better man. And um, I try to, uh, from, there, from there, I try to help people, and um, especially with baseball, you know. Uh, I, I love baseball, so, you know, anything that I could do to help them, you know, I, I would. And um, that's what it meant to me, you know, kept me off the streets. Yeah, would you like to share some of your thoughts on Miss Baker? Yeah, Miss um, Baker, uh, she was uh, always kind. You know, uh, um, look look out for the team. You know, for, for us. <laughs> you know, and uh, and she did whatever she could to uh, encourage us. Hello, I'm Bruce Dabney, and I proudly coach for the Greenville National League. I can remember that Greenville National Bruce Dabney teaching me the proper way of swinging and actually hitting the ball. He told me to take the bat. You wind up, you get your hands back, and you turn your hips. And when you're turning your hips, you bring the bat through the strike zone, and you go all the way through. And that would be a perfect swing as far as hitting the ball. It's all about eye and hand coordination. Eyes and hands seeing the ball, and the bat timing the ball, and hitting the ball, and turning it over and driving. That's the proper way of hitting Played for Greenville National in the 70s. Vince Person, IBS, Independent Beauty Supply. Yeah, my dad was uh, Mr. Coleman, Mr. Robert Coleman. Uh, all right, so my pops was, uh, was, 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 was one of the big time uh, managers in, in Greenville National Little League. Um, but the biggest influence I think my father had on, on a lot of people was he was always trying to influence the young guys and drop some knowledge on them. And he 
had a, a famous saying. Anybody that knew my pops, Mr. Coleman, they knew what his saying was, you understand? Because every time he said something to you, he wanted to make sure that you understood where he was coming from. So he'd tell you something, so you understand? And, um, you know, um, every friend that I had, every kid that I know who, who played down at Greenville National Good League, they always had like an affection for my pops because my pops was one of the guys who cared for them as people and always tried to drop some jewels on them because um, he wanted to see them be successful in life, not just successful in baseball. Yeah, another thing about my dad too is that he cared about the league and he was, um, you know, he never did anything for credit. He just did it for, for the betterment of the league. So um, he was a big uh, donation guy to the, to the league supporter. So if the league was in trouble or if anybody needed anything, you know, my dad was a guy who was like, you know what, if you need help, don't worry about it. Let me see what I can do. And he, he would really help out. So that was a big thing about my dad. So going through the footage in the archives, I was looking at an article and it said that, you know, my brother Kenny Coleman and his group, you know, Terrell Hampton and, and, and Leo Hagen, all those guys, John Stokes, they won the first district championship ever in Greenville National history. And, uh, you know, that was big accomplishment but my group in 1983 we went the furthest of any other all-star team in Greenville national history so we won the district we won the section we won the state um, so that was a big accomplishment for us you know uh, Ferris Toon played with me Barry Graves Travis Enix Stephen Haygood I mean we had a good a good group you know what I mean so I just wanted to put that on the record so everybody that's talking about all the heyday in Greenville national history 1983, we went the furthest of any team, all-star team in, our, in the league history. So we're very proud of that. We had such a good time down here. We would be out here all, we were basically all week. Once, once the season start, we come for practice through the weekends, and then Saturday and Sunday, we play baseball all day. The, little, the minor leagues would play all day Saturday. Sunday, we'd be down here, we'll play, and then we'll just watch everybody play, and everybody just enjoyed it. We had um, we had a ball down here. My first experience was kind of rough for me because I was a little younger than the rest of the kids I was playing with. So I went straight to the major leagues, but I got a lot of fundamentals. Mr. Dabney was a great coach because he always started from the fundamentals. And I actually started as an outfielder, made an error one day, and had to throw the ball from the fence to home plate. And he recognized how strong my arm was and turned me into a pitcher and schooled me on the art of pitching for the next two years before I actually started in the game. So I was really given an opportunity to learn the fundamentals of baseball before I was, what you would say, thrown to the wolves. And by the time I became a starter, I was well grounded and my foundation was there because of, the, because of that time spent. Kevin Archer, I played two years in Greenville National Little League and I can tell you it was the first league organized ball I ever played in. Um, it brought a whole community together. I mean, I can remember everybody walking down the hill, down Dwight Street, coming to the games because everybody's sons, daughters, cousins, grandkids was playing in this league. You know, shout out to Mr. Baker, you know, Mr. Perkins, Mr. Melvin, the Spring Brothers, Mr. Haygood, all those brothers that paved the way for us to find out what it meant, the value of sports, particularly baseball. And, and, and sports in its own teaches you about life, teaches you how to deal with things. And I learned a lot of lessons in this park playing with these brothers. And to this day, I still have relationships with jokers that you see in the streets, like, yo, what's up, man? How you doing? Blah, blah, blah. It was a big deal. I mean, and again, it was a community event. Saturday, Sunday, somebody was playing. Everybody was here. Everybody knew everyone. It was all love. You never really had any problems because everybody knew everyone. And I think that's part of the thing that's missing today. People don't know each other, you know? And that's something Greenville National Little League did for the Hill. Kept everybody together. Kept everybody as one. So I always remember those days playing in Greenville National Little League. I'm Tyrone Smith, Gray Smith's son. Yeah, my brothers, Terrence and Tracy, they were both left-handed, both of them playing first base and both was pitching. They was they was really good back then. I was proud of my brother when they was playing baseball right there. And they was like mainly the only two lefties on like brothers that was on the same team at one time. And then they was playing against each other. My mother would just have to be down there rooting for both of them at the same time, playing against and both of them pitching against each other. Those were some good memories back then. And my mom was a very integral part of the league. She handled the, the monies and stuff. And she was really, really used to pour her heart and all into it. And I guess just to see her work so hard kind of made me 
want to be motivated to be a part of it. I was proud to stick my chest out to know that my mother has something to do with such a great project. All right, Andrew's our assistant coach and scorekeeper, always there on our side, along with Harry. Make sure things got done correctly. Um, name some of the female um, players that was the first that came down to Greenville National Little League. Okay, Ashley, uh, proud to say my sister Wanda, she was the first female ball player in Greenville National Little League. She played a little infield. She pitched. Of course, yourself, and oh, you were out here. You were working as a coach, keeping score. And uh, of course, we needed you. And then you became a coach even. We got to love that. We also had um, Karen Threat. Um, as a matter of fact, I coached her. That was, uh, she was on uh, Independent Beauty Supply. And she was one of the one of the power pitches that we had. I really loved it. Now, some of my best times down here at Greenville National League was playing with the other players, but I still have to give it up to Mr. Carlos Baker. Because without him and his vision of what Greenville National Little League could be and was, it wouldn't be no Greenville National Little League. We also had the women that was behind the scenes, like Miss Angie Champagne. We had Miss West, Wanda West, Miss Baker, Miss Delsa. We had, and there's some other women, and we gotta give it up to the parents that came down here religiously to watch their kids play. They didn't send their kids to the park and say, all right, I'll see you later. No, they were down here with their kids, watching them play, showing the support for the league and their, play, and their sons and their teams. All right, we're going back and we're just reminiscing about the old times and about all the uh, people that supported us, the mothers, the sisters, and the families, the fathers. You know, and we just wanna get a little bit from everybody and. Uh, you know, what they thought about and their input as far as how they felt about that. There was um, a lot of parents that always used to get on us when we acted up. Mm -hmm. And one of the parents that helped keep us in line was Mrs. Baker, Derek Baker's mom. Right. I remember she was always present Saturdays and Sundays, regardless, she was always here. Mm -hmm. And if she saw us getting out of line, she checked us. Well, there was um, Greg's mother, Miss Mildred Britton, and she also was one of them go-to parents. She didn't play, and um, Miss Baker didn't play. Mr. Baker didn't play. No, they did not. Sure. I mean, all the kids were parents. something else. They were yeah, and I can't remember all of it, but you asked for it. I bet you he do. Look, they were parents. They were parents. Um, they came up on us, on the on the guys, on the kids, and uh, it would be something like, "Well, what are you doing? Yeah. Why are you over there? Yeah. But coming back, hey, the kids looked up. You get that little shock thing on coming up from them, and then all of a sudden, hey, they squared away. That's right. Now, this was the kind of things that, that I really like. Because, like like I said earlier, we taught. And yeah. um, kids, they learn, I hope. Right. But kids, they learn. And um, there's nothing like um, good people trying to teach children right. how to be children. That's I remember right. one of the biggest things was if I catch you over there by the railroad yeah, tracks, you off the team. Off the right. team. Oh that's man, right. we always wanted to go over there because it was right. just because we couldn't, so we yeah. wanted to. Forbidden land. <laughs> Every coach told you, <laughs> let me catch you over there. You won't that's be playing right. down here no more. That's right. Yeah. That was a good thing about it because it taught us respect, respect yeah. for our elders. Yeah. You know, it kept us out of trouble. And a lot of times, you know, the parents knew each other. So if one parent told another parent, you knew what time it was. So yeah, you yeah, didn't yeah, want to be yeah. in no kind yeah. of trouble yeah. like that. That's Getting right. back to um, another serious parent. Uh, parents, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Coleman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you understand me? <laughs> yes, you understand? <laughs> but Mr. Yeah. Coleman, yeah. this man, no matter what, if we needed it, Mr. Coleman, He'd go to his job. He'd go to his home. He'd go anywhere he needed to go to help us. Make sure it happens. Make that's the right. kids get what they need. That's right. Now, that's a parent. And Mrs. Coleman, she had it back all the way. She was here every day just like he was. Yep. Oh, no, 
All right, my name is Alfonso Williams. I'm from, originally from Jersey City. I played Little League Baseball at Greenville National Little League right here at Bayside Park. I played for Rado's Laundromat and I played for George Melody for TLC, which was Trinity Lutheran Church in my minor league season. It was a wonderful experience playing here. And my fondest memories is a cheeseburger that Mr. Baker used to make for us. He actually wrote that in my hat. Yes, I came out in about 1986. I was assistant coach for Alvin Sims. And I stayed, I think I was his assistant about two years, and then I became uh, head coach of uh, the Thundercats. Actually, my most difficult mom moments when we came down here, and um, we didn't have bathroom. I summoned the, I think Dan Wally was a uh, councilman at the time. We had summoned him down here because we knew that there was a bathroom in the building over there. And he came down and he told the authority at the time that he wasn't leaving until they opened up the build, uh, this building for us. Because we had parents and stuff had to go in the bushes. And that was one of the most difficult ones. It just seemed like our kids were just being neglected. I had a bowling league of my own too called Care Bear Youth Group that I started back in the 80s as well. When I got down here, I brought my son, which is about six or seven years old, and tried to teach him things about sports. Unfortunately, years ago, back in the day, parents wouldn't allow their kids to sign up for sports because of the insurance, so therefore I never got a chance to play any sports. But through John Gamble, I, he allowed me to come down and learn bowling as well as baseball, and I've enjoyed myself down here with my son as well as other kids. We have grown to be one big family down here. My name is Mobile Missouri. I coached the Crusher Sting and Bees, uh, like I said, for about 10 years, and then I went up to the major. That's when we was uh, Greenville National Little League. And then from there, uh, Boyd Neely came down, and he helped us with, along with Dan Wally, and we, we got the name changed to, to Jackie Robinson Little League. And that's when we got, uh, that's when we all got together and said we, we want to have, have the black names, the black league names. And so we, so we came up with black league names. Uh, my father memory was uh, dealing with the kids. Some of the kids had problems in school. We was good, like we would talk to them, set them down and help them out. And you know, try to correct them, things they were doing wrong. And, and some of the kids' parents could, couldn't afford to pay. So we would go in our own pocket and we would buy equipment. We would buy you know, the uniforms and, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and help pay for the kids so uh, for the kids who could play baseball. My name is Frank Tucker. I <clears throat> started uh, coaching at Greenville National in the early 80s because uh, my coach from Blue Crab Hall, who was a sponsor, he quit, it was Vern Dickey, and he quit and then I was like a pointer. But I had experience about playing baseball. I even played high school, you know, I played in the Tri-County League, in, and I'm from South Carolina. And I was uh, very familiar with it. I didn't want the job, but I was a pointer and I couldn't let my club down. So <laughs> I stayed here until the late 90s, I think. Uh, over 15 years, I know it was, somewhere in there. Till I decided, I think most of the group that I coached with had started to leave. So I didn't follow suit right away, but I later on, I did. And I had some good experience with the uh, kids that I coach. A lot of time I had to go to their house, get them out of the house because they had bad grades. They couldn't buy gloves. They couldn't buy uh, 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 cleats or uniform. Uh, but I used to go by and I was like a father figure to a lot of them. And the parents said, I wouldn't let him go if you didn't come by. So that really was, uh, you know, made me feel good. Some kids today 
They see me and say, how you doing that, Pop? <laughs> say, you was like my father, you know, when I used to play ball because you had to come get me in. My mother wouldn't let me go without you. But overall, he was one of the best athletes in the history of Jersey City. He was also a heck of an umpire and a referee. Uh, Harry, admit, I think he led in all sports in high school, three sports. That's how good he was. But in terms of the community, everybody knew Harry. Harry would give you the shirt off his back if he liked you. Now, if he didn't, he would let you know about that too. But he left, I mean, his legend, uh, he, he was a legendary person, truly a legend uh, in, in his own time. Not many people can do that. But Harry, Harry loved what he did. So his impact is still here. Oh, it's, it's going to always be because right. kids, kids live through Harry, right. you know. They, when they walk around, his memory is in them. They I may mean, not know it. You know, you know how you don't know you make an impact on somebody right. until you see them later on. And you can't remember the name, they remember you. Right. That's how Harry was. That's like Harry was another very influential man down here in uh, Greenville Nationals history. Uh, he had a big influence on the community, big influence on the league. Uh, very motivated and having the kids uh, strive to be their best. Uh, you know, I want to be, be able to also uh, give him a, a, a lot of recognition on the history of uh, Greenville National Fellow. Coach Harry. Harry had a show. He did not play. But I can tell you one thing about that man. He knew the game. And if you weren't prepared, you could forget about seeing that field. That man knew the game of baseball, and he taught us a lot. My name is Adrian Thorpe, played for Greenville National Little League from the 70s to the 80s. Favorite coach is Harry Hilliard. Harry Hilliard was the bomb. He was, he was a straight up, no nonsense coach, and my experience with Harry was all-star practice, he, me playing shortstop, and actually he was the first coach that really, really, really dug in my behind besides my father. But it was a play, it was a situation where the ball was hit the right field and the play was going to third and he wanted me to cut it. But I never, I never really understood it. So I, I kept letting the ball go straight to third and he was like, Tony Perkins, if you don't want to cut the ball, you can get the hell out of here. That was real from Harry Hilliard. So rest in peace to Harry Hilliard, man, a real Greenville national coach. Yeah, Harry Hilliard. Harry was a, Harry was a wild cat. I mean, he was, he was, he was a great guy, great ball player. Uh, him and I were good friends. Um, I met Harry, I guess, in Little League. Um, and he was coaching another team, and I had Murray Stars. Um, and uh, we were competitors for a long time until the end of the season when they went into All-Star break. And then Harry would call me in to, to help him. If he was called as the head coach or he was the manager, he would call me down to, to participate in the training and, and developing the kids for, for all-star competition. Um, so when I became manager of the all-star team, I called Harry to help me with, with my kids. And uh, we won a District 7 championship. But Harry was, uh, he was something else. Harry would yell, you could hear Harry all the way up on Garfield Avenue down here in the park because he'd be yelling and screaming and, and fussing and he fussed at the umpires, he fussed at the opponent, uh, uh, opposite team. and. But that was just his way. He was a good ball player. Him and I played with um, uh, softball together. He was the catcher and I was the first baseman. So we, we played a lot of ball together and we would come down here and run down to the park and make sure we got down here with the kids. So other than other than that, I just could, could say that I, I kind of miss Harry Hilliard. I, you know, he passed away. Uh, great talent, uh, great motivator, and just a good guy. Harry Hilliard, he coached Jeff Carwash. Great coach, great man. He uh, he put the fire in you. He put the fire in you. He would challenge the coaches. He would challenge the players. He taught me a lot. Yeah, thinking about Harry Hilliard. Harry was one of those special athletes who I believe came out of Marion Gardens or Duncan Projects, one of the two. And he was a very 
excellent athlete. Not just baseball, but an excellent football player as well. And I do know this because I played against him. And not only was he a player, but he was also one of the spokesmen on the teams that he played for. Harry participated in, in, in games up at Audubon Park. He played downtown, da- not downtown, but down there by Marion Garden, Lincoln Park. Me and Craig used to be down there almost every day playing paddle ball until we changed it to racquetball. But anyway, Harry was an excellent... Harry, what can I say about Harry? Just stubborn, kept on us. Stayed in our case, yelled a lot. He, he yelled so much, we, 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 we did not talk over him. Because he's what, coach? When he played for Oakland A's softball team, we used to go to the practice, everything. He took us to the Armory gym, watched them practice, gave us practice, hitting a hard ball on the gym floor, telling us don't move. At the age of 11 to 10 years old, a hard ball coming that hard at you, you're going to move. <laughs> so I mean, we, what? Um, pitching practice, I wasn't a pitcher, but since I was the captain, I had to be there. I always wanted to pitch. First thing he told me, close you're going to get the pitching is catching. He threw me behind the plate. Now, actually, I coached in high school a little bit just because of that reason. <laughs> that was my man, Harry. Harry, one of the loudest voices. You can hear him downtown, trust me. You can hear him down Lafayette. Um, very good coach. Um, very boisterous. Everybody thinks that he mean and whatever, but it was his way, yelling, screaming. Everyone got him, everyone learned. Even the co- other coaches learned. Now, Harry Hilliard was one of what I would call the new generation coach. To me, it was like Mr. Dad was the best, and then Harry came along, and he became the best. And I had the opportunity of not to play with Harry, but to coach alongside of him. And watch how he taught some of the techniques and how he kept up with baseball. He really knew the game. I could tell that he was a former player without him ever even telling me because how much compassion he had with teaching kids. I watched Harry develop these kids who was average baseball players to become great baseball players. And he took the all-star team to the furthest level they ever have reached in the history of the league. And I really, really had a lot of respect for Harry. I loved his drive. Everybody should talk about how crazy he was, but it wasn't crazy, it was just so passionate, so much compassion for the game and the will to win. And his compassion and, and, and for, for the will to win would transpose right to his players. Harry, great man, great person. The league meant a lot to him and us. Um, I'm learning that he's passed on. Um, I'm sorry to hear about that. He meant a lot to this league, along with Mr. Baker, um, his wife, all the Bakers. Um, they, they, led, they led a nation, pretty much led a nation, and um, helped a lot of kids, a lot of families, helped structure um, the foundations for a lot of pain. I played for Murray Shaw, The Rock. Uh, we got kicked out the league one year. The next year we won the championship. Lost one game, the first game of the year to bank. Didn't lose another game the rest of the year. Yeah, that was us. The Rock, our coach. Me, Sharperson, Cleveland Eatman, Glenn Sapp, a bunch of us. Cornelius Hagen, Richard Mack. Oh, uh, man, who else? Dante Lewis was on the first team when we got kicked out the league. Uh, yeah. How you get kicked out the league? Well, we weren't playing too good. <laughs> we weren't playing too good. We was hard-headed, didn't listen. And uh, Bruce told us time for us to get some, uh, some inspiration. Our vision for the Greenville National Little League was for us to carry on, to, to, to uh, impact on young men and young ladies, because now young ladies play Little League Baseball. But and, and handed it over to Mr. Baker, we knew we, we put it in good hands. However, when Mr. Baker left, I don't know what has happened to the league because exposure for kids is what it's all about. It's not about winning and losing games. By being exposed to all of the Jersey City, it builds character. You see how the people live. It's not an education gap or a baseball play gap. It's an exposure gap. The more you expose to other communities, you, you, you aspire to, to improve and, and to be better. And that's what I want for the Greenville National Little League. Greenville National Little League should never be a forgotten league. 
because it's the foundation of baseball in the Greenville area, in Jersey City. I mean, other leagues may have developed and he may have become more, more dominant right now in this day and age, but you can't forget where you came from. And Greenville National was the foundation of that. This, this is where we all, we, where it began. From, from a lot of great black men and black women put time and effort and blood and sweat into that league and to these kids to make sure that they could learn the game and develop it to young men and be, be something to society and get back to society. It's a shame that Jersey City doesn't take more time out to find out the information if you don't know. And honor the league. There's great men, Mr. Smith, Mr. Baker, my mother, Harry, Mr. Dabney, Mr. Stokes, Rock. It's a lot of great names that came out here and put a lot of energy and a lot did a lot for these kids. A lot of great ball players came through here. Kenny Coleman even went on to play with the White Sox. Vander Carter, Paul Chisholm, Tommy Marley, Dwayne Williams, Demont Lewis. So many great players played down here. These guys I learned from. Lewis Madigal got the pleasure to play with him in high school after this. Got pleasure to get coached by Mr. Dabney after playing with him in Greenville National Little League. Greenville National Little League was such an important part of Jersey City history. There's no way it should be considered a forgotten league. Seventh in the stretch. Greenville Little League is the best. Catch a signal to the pitcher so we can peep who's on deck. Parents cheering in the stands just peeping the game. Speaking the slang. Runners taking leads. Creeping again. Bases is loaded. Coaches tell their players to run. Having fun. Pitcher throwing heat. One after one, nine players on the ball field, all different age. Break them into groups of three so we can form the triple play. Kitties with cleats while grass and dirt lay at their feet. When this game is so sweet, we even play it in the street. Stadium pack, first throw of the game followed by hand clap. It's nothing like the Jersey afternoon without the gun clap. Think that's fat? You need to check out our back. Louis Sluggers, you could tell by the sound of the crack. We eating Cracker Jacks, go straight to the toy in the box. Man, it's funny how a game can change the vibe on the block. I'm waiting on you to go and hang that curve on oh, and run. It's gonna be that word. It's gonna be that word. It's gonna be that word. It's gonna be that faces. I'm waiting on you to go and hang that curve it's gone. Run, run, it's gonna be that word. 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 It's it doesn't matter about I'm the ending or end of the top nah. Me and my team always working a lot I found a field, yeah. you can believe it or not Greenville National Little League Baseball 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 Um, Miss Sab, you're going to get mad at me for saying this, but, um, um, I had all the boys with me, off of them, all of them, and that's another one. Um, one of the sad boys played for my team, but I can't think his name right now, but anyway, um, 
They all was inside, eating, drinking. I stole the car. And I stole Miss Sab car and learned how to drive in New York. Parked it. Never knew it was gone. I never do that again. Cause I was scared. But um we had fun at the Baker's house. Um, that was my second home, the Baker's. Uh, I go to the Baker's house and then I go to Joey's house, Tina's house, Willie Earl. Willie Earl and Mr. Baker was best of friends. When Slip used to get up the bat, Mrs. Hampton always had a favorite saying, what you gonna do, babe, what you gonna do? <laughs> and they got to train track, the ball went. <laughs> That's when Slip, home run. Every time she said it, home run, Slip. I also want to shout out a lot of the coaches that I remember. It was Mr. Cliff Perkins, Mr. Clifford Hauser, and Mr. Geets. For all y'all don't know, that's Mr. Craig Brown. We also had Mr. Baker, Mr. Stokes, Harry Hilliard. We had a couple of more, man. My mind is going crazy because this is like trying to bring back the best of the times we had as kids. This is Tyrone and Cush. One play for Jeff Carwash, one play for Rados. That was some two brothers that lived on Ocean Avenue. Hi, welcome to SassSports.com. We sell basketball uniforms, baseball uniforms, hockey gear, lacrosse items, tennis items, everything that you need for your sporting events. Please come visit us. We won't let you down. How you doing today? Thank you for coming down to Kelly's Soul Food today. Listen, get hungry, come on down to see us. We got everything. Just for vegetables and side orders today, we doing black eyed peas, lime and beans. We do a mixed peas. I got cabbage, collard greens, rice and gravy, baked macaroni and cheese, candy and macaroni salad and potato salad. And I count about 13 different meats. I'm talking about meatloaf, oxtail, turkey wings, shrimps, pork chops, turkey chops, um, smoked ribs, smoked chicken, chop by because it's a good weekend. Come on down. We are in the, in the best homemade cakes, pies, peach cobbler, and cornbread to go. Looking forward to seeing you. Take care. God bless you. What's your address? 596 Community Avenue, New Jersey City, New Jersey. Or give me a call, 201-432-90. How you doing? I'm Sloan Davis, coach of the Monarchs down here, Jackie Robinson, coaching with Coach Stone over here. This is my first year back, so I'm enjoying it. I'm going to teach these kids what I learned when I was coming up. Hi, my name is Etheridge Stone. I'm with Jackie Robinson Little League. I've been down here for a number of years now, and we also, we really need your help as far as umpiring, as far as maintaining the field, as far as our concession stand, as far as our scoreboard. Uh, we would appreciate if anyone, if we can get anyone to come down and help us out. We really need your help. Thank you.